Oh. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webcast, Preparing for Successful Data Management Implementation, presented by Matt Lane, Director of Consulting Services with Hagerman & Company. This presentation is being broadcasted in a listen-only mode. You can ask questions by typing them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel on the side of your screen, and Matt will address your questions at the end of his presentation. At the end of the broadcast, when you exit GoToWebinar, you'll be prompted to fill out a short three-question survey. We ask that you take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. Lastly, all attendees will receive a certificate of attendance and a link to the recording of this presentation. Matt, whenever you're ready, you may begin. All right. Thank you, Berdina. And thank you to everyone who has joined us here this morning or this afternoon, depending upon your time zone. I think we've got probably a 45-minute or so uh, presentation here just talking about, as you can see, uh, just some things we've learned over the past few years about uh, hoping to make a, your data management implementation successful. <coughs> Uh, probably, you know, don't have all the answers here, but hopefully some of the things that we are going to pass on will be of benefit to you either in you know, a new implementation or your current implementation or current system. I think uh, this presentation, I probably last gave it about four years ago, it looks like, and uh, we've now updated it uh, for a more current technology products, other things we've learned. Uh, so hopefully this will uh, be a good investment of every, everyone's time here over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, just a little background on our company before we get started. For those of you who aren't familiar, we have been doing data management implementations for 20 years now. And we've done approximately 400 installations over that time. And we've got six implementation and support experts in our data management area and that's that's actually really separate of our CAD application engineers who are very expert at installing and implementing the Autodesk Vault product which is one of the, the mainstays of our of our product line so in, in total we probably really have about 20 people who are expert in data management, uh, either on you know, the, the implementation and CAD management side or on you know, the networking, the server, the consulting side as well. And then the main products that we handle, and we'll touch on these a little bit, but I don't want to spend much time at all, uh, the Autodesk Vault product line, Bluecello Meridian, Synergist Adept, Autodesk PLM360, and Autodesk Buzzsaw are probably the main products that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll touch on these a little bit more, uh, but really this session we want to more focus on generalities of successful data management rather than being really product-focused in this session. My own personal background, I've actually been with Hegerman and Company for 30 years now. Uh, the first 15 or so years I was a CAD CAM application engineer and then about 15 years ago, I switched over and became director of consulting services, which has the responsibility, overall responsibility, for our data management line of business. So I oversee both the pre-sale and the post-sale technical aspects of that and do a lot of uh, consulting, scoping for customers as well. And if some of the, I'll just buzz through these kind of quickly, uh, just some of the different companies that we've implemented solutions for, large companies, small companies, manufacturing, engineering, healthcare, utilities, um, on the manufacturing side, both discrete and process-oriented manufacturing. Uh, so we've got you know, quite a breadth of experience across all industries. Now, since we're talking about data management, which is a pretty generic and broad term, I did want to kind of classify a little bit on some of the acronyms that are out there that you might see 
and then some of the solution types. And really, there's a lot of gray area here uh, between the different solution types. You know, it's not real hard and fast that, oh, this product is PDM and this product is PLM or, or what you're doing is PDM versus what you're doing is PLM. There, there's a lot of overlap and gray area between the different solution types. But, uh, you know, some of the acronyms you see out there, EDM, uh, which stands for Electronic Document Management, is a, you know, a pretty generic term for generic document management across, you know, generally applied across a broad set of document types, a broad set of company departments, not focused in any particular area. Another maybe more up-to-date acronym you see is ECM, which stands for Enterprise Content Management, which would also typically include documents, but maybe, maybe um, merge in uh, some other data sources and databases. But again, ECM would be more of a kind of a broad across different company departments, across all document types type of context. Uh, PDM, that's probably a term that most of you have heard, stands for product data management. And that tends to focus in the most on engineering. And a large part of that is, of course, going to be CAD files and CAD data, but it could be other associated product or engineering data like bills and material and those kinds of things. And you know, a lot of this will then vary from industry to industry. PDM is, is typically a, a term that you see applied within discrete manufacturing as opposed to process manufacturing or AEC or other, other type environments. <coughs> then PLM is another long time term that's been out there uh, which it stands for product life cycle management. Again, it mostly applies within a manufacturing environment, though I, mean, I like to think of it that P could really also stand for project, project life cycle management, or for plant in a uh, facilities type environment for plant life cycle management. Where this PLM refers to a much broader concept, so it's not just engineering, it's not just CAD. It relates to all company departments, all types of data, whether they're files or just data records that fully describe and document either that product, that project, or that plant. I've got an, another slide here in a second that illustrates that. And then project collaboration, those are typically cloud-based solutions, uh, maybe most predominantly used in, a, in an AEC environment or a, a plant or facilities environment where a lot of collaboration is done with outside engineering firms or with uh, contractors and construction companies uh, for sharing the documents and data relating to a plant or a construction project. And the PLM concept, I thought this slide kind of illustrates it well, <coughs> where we have a picture of a, uh, a product here in the center, and then around the side you can see all the different areas, all the different pieces of data. You know, typically, in, you know, and probably most of you um, are fairly CAD focused. Some of you may be more, more broad than that. You know, our company has been fairly heavily CAD focused because of our background with the Autodesk CAD products. So we tend to think down here in this engineering box or maybe this conceptual design box, that's kind of the center of our world, you know, the product designs and so on. But when you think about a, a product or a project or a plant, there's a lot of other areas and pieces of data, you know, you can see as uh, we get into you know, the sales end uh, for this product, if it's an engineered to order product or a project, you know, there's sales contracts, sales quotes that relate to this. 
on the production or the execution or the construction side. <coughs> There's all these documents and data relating to make, buy, margins, processes, uh, inspection information, certification information, support incidents relating to this project, you know, retirement and disposal. Uh, so you can see PLM is designed to relate to all of that. Now the different types of systems that we provide, and again over the last few years we've seen the cloud-based solutions become more prevalent. Uh, we're still a lot of our work is installing land-based solutions, land and land-based solutions where all the files and data being managed are stored on our customer's premise uh, with a central server and then there's desktop software installed on each client's computer, providing direct integration with CAD and other applications, and then the customer typically provides a server and back-end database software to house it. That's traditional data management, traditional PLM. Now we're starting to see more cloud-based solutions come into play, like with the Autodesk PLM 360, where the files and data are, are stored off-premise, the end user software is browser based. You know, it's because of that, it's not directly integrated with your CAD application. And then the vendor, such as Autodesk, provides the server and back end database software in their own data center. Probably where cloud based solutions first became prevalent was in the uh, sales area, uh, like uh, salesforce.com was probably the first big one there, gradually moving into other areas. Uh, for managing CAD files, native CAD data, the cloud is not there yet just because of the nature of trying to move those big CAD files over the internet for opening, saving, and, and so on. The performance just isn't there. Now over the next few years, we may see that change, but for managing native CAD data, the LAN or WAN-based solution is still today where you want to be looking for a solution. Probably a lot of you out there are familiar with Autodesk Vault. You know, there's the two different levels, basic or the three different levels, basic vault, and then also work group and professional. Work group is included with many of the Autodesk CAD applications. Strictly designed for the CAD user for managing work in process. Work group and pro are available for all users to get into release and revision management and a whole host of other features. And I don't want to drill down too far on, on that because that's really not what this presentation is about. And then uh, Blue Cello Meridian and Synergist, Blue Cello Meridian and Synergist Adept are other two solutions that we recommend and install for customers. Similar to Vault, uh, manage CAD files, installed on your premise, uh, maybe have a little bit more application for other company departments, uh, integrate with a variety of different CAD software, and then have some advanced capabilities with workflow, bill of materials, multi-site, and so on. Then the two cloud-based solutions that were involved in the Autodesk PLM 360 for Enterprise PLM and Autodesk Buzzsaw for project collaboration. So that was, uh, I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of overview and background as far as where we're coming from, what we offer, and then get into kind of the, the meat of the presentation and the core subject. Now for those of you who've never implemented a data management solution before, they're typically not something you just want to install and do on your own. So we typically recommend, whether you're working with us or working with someone else, that you contract with some outside, for some outside services for an organization that's very experienced in, in doing not just the installation of the software, but actually installation assistance as well. And you can see here some of the our typical project scopes 
for working with a customer for uh, the basic vault software. It's designed to be a very simple solution that we implement in two to five days. The other solutions we implement, we typically run five to 15 days of consulting services to help a customer perform their installation and implementation. And in all cases, that would be a fairly basic project, you know, because if you add in, uh, if you have a, like a much higher number of users, additional sites, want to get into a lot of customization and system integration, then the number of days of services that you'd be looking at could go higher. But that you know, one of our recommendations is you know always budget for some implementation assistance to make sure things go correctly, and then get an un a realistic understanding of based on your project what is really needed. And what we see as some of the prerequisites for a project, you know, one is assembling your team, where and we see a lot less of this than we saw five to ten years ago, where uh, companies we find do tend to work better as a team now, I think, than uh, than in the past of you know getting a, a proper team with the proper people from the company operating departments and IT uh, to really make sure that everyone is is working together rather than one person or one department, you know, trying to lone ranger things. Is that, uh, that typically ends up with a lot of uh, resistance and running into walls and, and that kind of thing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Analysis and selection. You know, sometimes it's, you know, it's easy to go for the product you know or the product another company you know has, but there really are differences between the products. So it's you know very important to make the analysis something you really dig into and do. And then uh, another key thing for a project, prerequisite for a successful project, is to obtain full management support. Now if you're Looking at a, a simpler Autodesk Vault basic project, this may not be as critical, although you, if you're in an engineering group, <coughs> you really will need to obtain management support so they will allocate IT resources in terms of personnel and possible server hardware in order to support your installation. As your projects go bigger, across multiple departments, across longer implementation times, it becomes more and more critical that you have management support for the project. Because um, once you, a lot of times management may think we've supported the project because we've allocated the dollars and um, cut the purchase order, but after that, you know, there's always the day-to-day -day pressures to get work out the door. If you've got a longer-term project, the temptation can be to divert people away from making this project a success that's going to have huge long-term benefits for your organization to doing, you know, what's necessary, what's more expedient today to get work out the door. So there can be a temptation to sacrifice the long term or the short term so personnel resources get pulled away from your implementation project, um, especially if that's a longer, longer project. And then also as you're, you know, here in the project prerequisite, so you're still kind of, you know, at the evaluation stage it's also important at that time to think about implementation phases. If it's 
if it's a bigger project or even if it's a smaller project. And I'll talk about this more. We think this is one of the, <coughs> the keys to success and keys to avoiding failure is breaking a project into logical phases so you can get some success in the near term to get pe keep people excited and then move you know further and further into more phases and build on it because it's uh, if if an implementation is a number of months without people having anything tangible to see or to benefit from you know that's when support for a project can really wane both from a departmental from an end user a departmental manager and an upper management standpoint so short quick successful phases uh, really catch people's attention and keep the commitment going. And then kind of along the same line is planning for ongoing support and maintenance. Again, that part of that is just planning, you know, knowing that that's going to happen. Part of it is also, again, goes back to that management support that they're going to allocate the personnel resources uh, within IT and departments to provide the support that they will continue uh, maintaining and updating the software and so on. It's also important to think about, discuss, and agree on what is the real scope of your project in terms of both the short term and the long term. And I guess I've kind of broke this down five different ways. A lot of what we do, especially with the Autodesk Vault product, you know, we're very much doing a departmental solution. Uh, where you know, Vault is primarily designed uh, for the engineering department, managing CAD, possibly other data. Although Vault is e evolving, um, and we're looking at expanding it more beyond just the engineering department. Uh, but a lot of times our vault implementations are you know conceived and, and implemented as departmental solutions. And that's and that's that's fine. There's nothing nothing wrong with that. It's just important to understand and agree that that's what you're doing if that's what you want to do. Uh, I might jump down, skip a bullet. Uh, we're also doing a lot of multi-site implementations. One of the things we've seen over the last few years is a trend for companies with multiple locations really trying to bring those locations together so they're operating as one company, one organization. The, most companies have their wide area networks in place now to allow that uh, data and file sharing and then more companies are wanting to share engineering resources between those locations. Uh, so that is a big area to look at is a single a, a departmental solution but multi-site. Or we can, uh, a lot of times we're looking at a scope involving multi-departments so it might be engineering and manufacturing or you know could be could be any anything. So again, if you really decide on a multi-departmental solution, obviously key to have the right people from the right departments involved. In some cases, you know, beyond multi-department, it'd be all company departments and looking at an enterprise type solution. You know, at that point, um, usually in that case, that's not anything engineering is really driving anymore, although they may be a key player. Uh, typically, enterprise-type solutions are driven by IT and upper management with engineering input to ensure that the, the tools selected will work properly with their design tools. And then also collaboration with outside parties. <coughs> like we mentioned, the Buzzsaw software. 
with traditional data management, we hear this come up a lot as something on a wish list, but not really defined as if it's something you're really going to do and that IT supports it for sharing the data. Uh, so we really strongly recommend that you really decide as an organization what is the collaboration need, what collaboration are we going to allow, what access to our files, our data, our network are we going to allow outside parties to have. And we talked about assembling the project team. Because of our focus, you know, engineering is almost always involved because we, you know, from our legacy as a CAD supplier and we still are, engineering is always involved. And as I mentioned before, we've really seen this hugely improve over the last few years is engineering and IT working together. So for our project, really a minimum of your team needs to have a minimum of engineering and IT on it. You really, um, if you're in engineering, you really need the IT support uh, to make sure that the network infrastructure, the server is in place, uh, the backups are going to happen, that you know, IT is, is gathering all they need to support your installation from an infrastructure standpoint. And then if you're in IT, you really need engineering as well if they're going to be the main user so they can really help determine that the, the tool that they're going to get is going to be a, a fit for them. And then beyond that, other departments, as, other departments and other locations as needed based on the scope of the, of the project. One thing we have seen in the multi-site installations, it is very critical that if it is multi-site that you get buy-in from people at the other locations. We found this especially true. We've done projects that involve multi-site replication between the United States and Europe, and maybe the United States is driving it. It's very important to have those European or other geographic locations involved so that when the software gets implemented, they're really committed to using it and behind it. Because um, if not with the, the geographic and language distance, you know, it's, it has sometimes proven to be difficult to keep everyone committed and on the same, same page. One of the key things we stress, again, we're looking at the pre-implementation phase, is, <coughs> and we do, and we do this when we demonstrate, is you know we show you the nice features of the software. Well, we think even with that, it's a mistake to buy software. You don't buy software because of the nice features that you like that it has. You really, you know, you're making a business investment, and business investments should be driven by a return on investment. Um, you know, something might be a nice feature, but then when you look at it, it really doesn't have that much positive benefit in terms of your efficiency or cost reduction or quality improvement or that kind of thing. Uh, so sometimes it's easy to get caught up in uh, G whiz type features, but it's more important to really understand what is the operating and financial impact on our company of those features and capabilities. And we've kind of highlighted some of the main areas that can have a positive operating impact on an organization. And some of those, some of those things you know, when you get into Inventor, the where used, uh, where if I'm going to change a part file, I don't want to be messing up other assemblies because that can have a, a major impact. Um, so, you know, analyzing the ROI there, how much time have I, without a tool that has where used, how much time are we having to spend to run that analysis 
before we can change a part, or we've had these accidents and how much have they cost us. So really break that down to a, a dollar value in terms of you know, reducing scrap and rework, saving time. Uh, also search and retrieval. You know, a lot of times we'll hear, you know, it, it's hard to find information and it takes too long. Well, it's really important to quantify that. If we had a better solution, how much time would we save either on the shop floor or improving design reuse, uh, reducing printing and distribution costs? Again, is that just nice or how much money are we really saving? Uh, other areas like in facilities, reducing manufacturing downtime, achieving and maintaining compliance. And you can see some of these other items as well. Bill of materials. Uh, can we pass bills of material automatically from CAD to our business system and save the time and the money of retyping? And what we found, the ROI phase and an ROI study can really help drive you to the correct solution where again you know we find out what areas have the most financial impact on your company that will drive you towards selecting a system that offers you the best improvement in that area so the we think looking at that ROI really getting down to the nitty-gritty of of the numbers is a huge aid in driving you towards the correct solution. In fact, we've got a spreadsheet here uh, that we can provide to customers that uh, really helps you quantify the time and the money savings relating to those different areas, including you know, document revision usage areas, errors, people getting an old rev, um, and then quantifying the reduction of scrap costs, rework costs, product recall, product recall costs, uh, reduced spent time retrieving drawings or other documents. You know, in the shop and customer service, we've got 50 lookups a day, how many work days, how much time, employee costs, percent improvement, you know, really driving it down to a dollar figure. Quantifying the dollar value of improved design reuse. And you can see some of these other other areas as well from the, the PowerPoint slide, really getting those quantified so you can see where the big benefit is, which then again you know, drives you to the correct solution. Another key area of a successful implementation is really just the system requirements, supported software, current infrastructure compatibility. Um, I mean, we don't want to walk in and start an installation and find out that your current computer network, computer and network operating environment or your engineering standards are not really compatible with the software that's been selected. So we think it's very important to create an overall environment profile document before you start as far as what your current computer configurations are, both desktop and server, what application software packages you're using, including the version of each. That's becoming more and more critical. Um, if your CAD, CAD or other software is too new or too old to work with the data management solution, that needs to be highlighted and fixed. Uh, also, you should, before you start on a project, and probably even before you start an evaluation, document your file naming conventions, directory structures, revision schemes, workflows like engineering change workflows, legacy databases. Those are all very important things to understand, document, and share as part of your uh, pre-purchase evaluation. And then drilling down further, if this is going to involve managing CAD data, a CAD environment profile. Uh, 
and this is becoming more and more important. And when I um, have done this presentation in the past, is thinking about it. We back then, you know, back in the old days, you know, really going far back, we had vanilla AutoCAD, and then maybe you had XREFs and viewing and title block linking. Then, as we move further along. Uh, Inventor came along, which brought in a, a host of new challenges with the file interrelationships. And as Inventor has moved further, it's added more and more advanced functionality. Then in the uh, AEC environment, you know, Revit has come along, which is a totally different CAD platform. Then in the AutoCAD-based area, we've seen the verticals come along, auto, like AutoCAD Electrical. Plant 3D, PNID, Civil 3D, which those are fantastic tools with a lot of specialized features, but they also have uh, some uh, quirks. Probably isn't the right word, but you know they've got their own databases, project files that relate to them. So CAD integration has been a much uh, is much more complicated than it used to be, so it's very important to fully document exactly what CAD software you're using, what version, how do you, how are you using the CAD tool? You know, if you have AutoCAD Electrical, are you really using the full functionality of it, or do you plan to in the future? So that's really becoming more and more critical, and a lot of data management vendors are struggling now because of the increased demand on the CAD integration side of things, because the, the CAD software tools have gotten so much more sophisticated beyond just the vanilla AutoCAD, XREF, TotalBlock viewing days. And then drilling down further, you really want to document your standards and your environment in these other areas as well. And then determining what files and data to be managed. One of the the big questions we run into is, are you going to bring your legacy data? I mean, typically focused on uh, the CAD data, for the most part, for discussion purposes. Is it important to bring your legacy CAD data into the system? Now, if you're, uh, say, in a plant and facilities environment, uh, where a big thing is making allowing maintenance people to access your files, and yeah, you want to bring the legacy information in. If you're in a, a manufacturing environment where you're doing engineered-to-order projects, where everything is kind of custom, or if you're in an AEC or construction-type environment where everything is project-based, then maybe bringing the legacy data in <coughs> isn't all that vital and you're just going to use the data management tool on a go-forward basis. We've seen some companies get too hung up on that they have to have all their legacy data in there, which in some cases that can be a huge project to clean and validate the legacy data. The import process, the import tools don't take that much to run, but just going through the legacy data to sort out what's what, what's the most current. That can be a laborious process. So we recommend you know, don't get hung up on bringing legacy data in. So you know, you know, what's, the, what's the ROI? That's really the question. What's the return on investment of bringing in the legacy data? You know, the number of hours we're going to spend versus the benefit that it's going to give. And you may want to develop a strategy of bringing legacy data in as the files are modified or touched again. So again, you know, it's a matter of really drilling down to the business side of it. What's our return on investment? Also, for a lot of our customers in the plant and facilities area, uh, older scan drawings, those are still very critical. You know, what's your strategy for importing those, accessing those? Is the software that you're looking at, you know, not just good for the latest CAD software, but it, is it also good for controlling and sharing scan drawings? 
and then also other engineering supporting documents and so on, is that something you're going to do initially, not at all, or do you have a phase-in plan for bringing in other engineering supporting and other departments' files? IT infrastructure, again, we've talked about this. IT definitely needs to be involved in any project. Uh, determining your file storage requirements is very important. One of the big benefits of a CAD data management solution is the ability to manage and track old revisions. That's a huge benefit. A lot of companies now, they just overwrite. So all they have is the last rev. They don't have any rev history to go back to. All the systems we work with, the way they manage revisions is each revision is a completely separate file. There's no behind the scenes magic to only save the differences. So it's a huge benefit, but going to a data management solution for CAD can greatly increase your file storage requirements. So you really want to be working between engineering and IT to you know get a and your vendor to understand how many revs are we going to average per file, what's the average file size and calculate those file storage requirements. The, the Vault, Adept, and Meridian software, again, is client server based on your premise. So you do will need to provide a server and you know, review the requirements, compare that to existing servers you might have. Uh, you may need to also budget for buying a new server. And then will that server be dedicated just to the data management system? Or is it possible that it will be shared for another purpose as well? <coughs> the software we work with, the general recommendation is to have a dedicated server, although if the server is also being used for just managing other files, that's fine, or maybe some light application, but you don't want your data management server to also be your business system server, your email server, or domain controller, that kind of thing, because that can really cause performance bottlenecks, uh, create risks, uh, create downtime when it's time to do upgrades, and that kind of thing. All of these solutions use a database backend for managing and tracking all of the file information. And you can see the options that are available. All the solutions we work with will work with Microsoft SQL Server. It definitely seems to be the most popular tool out there. And there's different versions and flavors of it from Microsoft. Uh, Autodesk and Synergist will work with the SQL Express version of Microsoft SQL Server. However, it does have some limitations in terms of multi-site replication, number of files you can manage, and so on. Synergist and Bluecello will also work with Oracle. And then Bluecello has their own database called Hypertrieve. So one of the steps in an implementation is to work with your IT department to determine what database system is right for you based on you know, number of users, number of files you're going to be managing, company standards that you might have. Uh, also, when you get into the databases, there's different versions of the database, like Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, there's 2012, 2008, 2005. There's different service pack levels. There's different release levels of the software. And all of the solutions are very specific about the version, the release, and service packs that they are compatible with. So you really want to work closely with IT and your vendor to make sure you've got the right thing in place. Uh, also, that's another reason to have a dedicated server. 
in that you might be running your business software off of SQL Server 2005, but if you want to be on the current version of CAD, that requires the current version of, say, Vault, for instance, which requires you to be on SQL 2008 or 2012. So sometimes the compatibility requirements between different in-house SQL-based systems may not be the same. So sometimes sharing a SQL server among multiple different applications is not the best route to go, and, and usually it's not a route that we recommend. Now, one of our uh, one of our vendors has a seven-step implementation overview that they provide, and they break it down like this. And some of these we've kind of talked about. We've really hit on, I think, the um, maybe the first three here. Uh, then they see the next step as far as training users and administrators integrating with other in-house information systems, custom programming, and post-implementation support. Well, I think um, probably the most important thing from the way they break it down, and I think this is important, is that system integrations and custom programming, if possible, should always try to be done as later phases. So just always try to get up and working with you know an out of the box type implementation where maybe you you know gone into the screens and configured it for your needs but try to avoid if at all possible system integrations and custom programming until later phases again so you can uh, phase things in get going quickly and then build on that Uh, preparing files and data. Uh, again, you know this goes back to our legacy, legacy data import and taking a look at that. Uh, because importing legacy data, we go into a lot of customers and find that's going to be a real chore, largely due to resolving duplicate file issues. We find in a lot of cases where companies haven't had a data management solution. They may get multiple copies of the same file around different places on different servers, on end user workstations, and when you go to a data management solution that's designed to be a single source of information where everybody goes to that one location and that is the correct latest version. So before you import any information into the data management system, you really want to know what's the current rev and import it. So resolving duplicate file issues, it's typically not something we as a vendor can help you do because we don't, wouldn't have the knowledge of all your files and designs and so on. So if you are going to import your legacy data, it's very important to understand what's going to be involved in making sure you have the correct legacy data to bring in. Uh, also another couple of other items, uh, again if you've been using CAD for a long time there may be legacy CAD files out there you haven't touched in a long time. You may find that they're saved under a very old version of the CAD software or if you're on Inventor or AutoCAD with XREFs those files may no longer open properly because some of the children have moved or been renamed. So getting all the files upgraded to the current revision may be something that needs to be done. And then uh, worst case is some of those links may need to be fixed before the data can come into the system. Again, I, you know, these are all things that need to be considered and looked at really before you pull the trigger, really I think on an order and a project, uh, really make sure you've got all your ducks in a row as far as what's going to be involved in making the installation a success. 
in some projects, but not all projects, a pilot phase is, if not required, at least highly advisable. A lot of our projects we do now are migrations from older, outdated data management systems, or maybe just drawing Microsoft Access-based drawing databases, which can involve some fairly intricate database migration. In fact, we're uh, finishing up one in implementation this week at a, at a steel plant that's involved uh, actually a migration from two different systems and merging and comparing the data. In cases like that, we always recommend a pilot. So sample data is imported or migrated, and then a select set of users are pilot testing the system. Also, this is highly advisable in the case where you've got a lot of users. I mean, if you've got 40 users, you don't want to turn the system loose without making sure everything is working properly because you really cause a major productivity problem for your organization. So in that case, we we'll recommend performing a pilot test uh, where a certain subset of your users are trained, and then they test the system before you know all the data, the rest of the data is migrated, or all the rest of the users are turned loose. So a, a pilot, a pilot phase involves possibly a subset of your users, a subset of your legacy data. Could involve a pilot project where we're going to, uh, we've got this design project, we're going to do it in the new system, while other projects continue to be done using our old method. So how you define what a valid pilot is will vary depend on you know, the nature of your legacy data, the nature of the work that you do, um, and that's really a place where we're here to help as well is you know to map out what is a good live implementation strategy, what is a good pilot implementation strategy. And again ongoing support and maintenance. Central points of contact. Um, you know if you got a lot of users out there they need to know who the go-to person is internally if they've got a problem with the system. Kind of who your lead users, your lead administrators are. Uh, maybe you've got an internal help desk if you're a larger company. Um, in that case, your internal help desk people need to be trained on the software. Or there may be like a lead user expert um, guru in your engineering department. Regardless, you know, users need to know who the go-to person is internally as a first line of defense if they need help. Installation of upgrades. This is something, again, very important to think about. Probably most of you, again, uh, you and your organizations use CAD. As new versions of CAD come out, you're going to want to implement them either right away or at some point. One of the things to always remember in going to a data management system is that if you upgrade your CAD software, don't do it unless you've either validated your data management software will work with it. And in most cases, you have to up upgrade your data management software before you upgrade your CAD software. And the internal data management software is always client server based, so IT always needs to be involved in regard to getting the server software updated, and then either engineering or IT can get the client software updated. And in most cases, uh, most of our customers work with us uh, to have us assist with deploying the upgrades. Another area that I can't stress enough, and we, we run into this a lot, um, and it scares me to death sometimes, is we still run into cases where customers are not properly backing up their data management system. We'll find customers have not run a backup for a year. 
all the data management solutions have their own backup routines, backup utilities that need to run on a, if not on a nightly basis, at least on a weekly basis, before your tape backup runs. And, you know, uh, companies will have turnover within their engineering or their IT department, and sometimes as, you know, those positions trade hands, uh, the new people don't realize this, and so the data management backup tools uh, quit getting run, and then, you know, obviously you become very much at risk of data loss if that backup's not there and your server hard drive crashes or something. So if you've already got a solution in place, I highly recommend you validate that the backups are running and are up to date, and if you deploy a solution in the future, you know, make sure that it's properly running to begin with and then continually monitor to make sure that those backups are happening. Because we, we continually run into cases out in the field where we're um, seeing that not happen. I haven't talked about PLM, but as much, we tend to focus more on this uh, in this session on around CAD data management. But PLM, as you saw, it's a much broader concept. So that's always going to be, if you're really going to get the bang for your buck, a much bigger project involving more people, more departments, more data, and probably more legacy systems. So on a PLM, you know, keys to PLM success are to really get a total evaluation of your overall company workflows and processes, a global view, and departmental involvement in the selection process, and then legacy data sources, system integrations, and automation are huge keys to PLM success. Really, without those three things, uh, it's hard to really make PLM a total success so that somebody can, you know, go to an item and find all of the data from all systems and all sources in regard to that, uh, in regard to that item. Uh, probably this is a whole session unto itself. Um, I just did want to at least have one slide there that uh, just details the additional breadth and scope of a PLM project. And finally, this is my last slide here, uh, just things we've run into in the field over the last 20 years, you know, highlighting uh, problems to avoid or things to do to avoid problems. Poor vendor selection, I think that's fairly obvious. Inadequate CAD integration is something we're seeing creep up more now. <clears throat> you know, there's vendors out there that will tout their CAD integration. Oh, we work with Inventor, we work with AutoCAD, we work with SolidWorks, and so on. But it's really up to you to, to really dig in and, you know, do you properly support all of the features of Inventor that we use? Do you properly support all of the AutoCAD verticals we might use and their features, such as, you know, electrical, PNID, Civil 3D, and so on. Do you support 2015 already? Uh, so we're seeing inadequate CAD integration become more of an issue. Also, you want to think about not just where we are today, but where we're going in the future. You know, are we if we're just using vanilla AutoCAD, is that all we're ever going to use? Or down the road, are we going to be using some of the verticals? Do we see that coming? Well, you don't want to spend a big chunk of change on something that manages what you're using today, but doesn't work with what you're using tomorrow. Scope creep and scope change. One thing we do uh, before we do a project is we, we put together a full document that just lines out exactly what we're going to do so that as we start and different people aren't saying, you know, trying to expand the project 
make it too big, change what it is, and we really work with the customer to, to get agreement. That's something we do, or it might be something you might want to do, uh, just to make sure that the vendor you're working with, people in the other departments within your organization are all on the same page as to what exactly the scope of the project is. Because um, I think we've all probably heard, maybe experienced uh, some of the problems with scope creep and scope change. Skipping the pilot phase, you know, if, if a pilot is appropriate based on some of the things we talked about, the, you know, the number of users, the legacy data, that kind of thing, uh, you know, don't try to short circuit things, do it too quick and skip a pilot phase. Uh, we talked about the benefits of a phased implementation. Again, don't try to go too far too fast and do a big bang rather than a phased implementation. Loss of personnel resources. <coughs> Again, this, I think this goes back to uh, commitment of upper management so that post-sale, upper management or departmental management doesn't pull the resources away from the data management project to do other things. And so the data management project is then starved of personnel resources. Poor infrastructure. Um, it's best if your infrastructure is not adequate, no matter how great the software is. A poor infrastructure is going to be your undoing. So, you know, if you can't invest in any necessary upgrades in servers or WAN or desktop computers, it's really better off not to take on the not to take on the project. We talked about the backups and then. The data management tools, all the ones we work with and you know, other ones out there are very good at uh, being configurable, but sometimes you do have to make some compromises to do an out-of-the-box solution where it can be tempting to try to customize and program the software and the interface to exactly what you want. That's usually a mistake, you know, if it's going to involve too much customization and custom programming. So that's kind of a temptation to avoid. I think that's my last slide. And we've actually run a little bit longer than what I projected. So hopefully everyone's gotten some good information out of this. At this point, I can, I'm going to go to my question panel and answer any questions that have been entered so far or give you the opportunity to ask some now. Don't see any questions so far, but we'll hold things open a couple of minutes for any questions anyone would like to ask. And uh, while we're waiting, Verdina, do you have any final information to pass on on your end? Um, no, I would just like to thank everyone for attending, and um, like Matt said, we will leave the line open for a few more moments if anybody has any questions. After we close the session, if you have a question, you can reply to the confirmation or the reminder email you receive from GoToWebinar, and we can get those over to Matt. Um, and just another reminder, you will receive an email containing a link to the recording of the presentation. And if you could take a few moments to fill out the short survey that will appear on your screen when you close the session, we would greatly appreciate it.